ABC presents Behind the Magic, Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. Tonight, the story of how one of the most beloved movies ever, Snow White, almost never got made. Join us as we take a fascinating journey inside the making of this magical film. Narrated by ABC's own Snow White, Jennifer Goodwin. Of course, Snow White is my favorite fairy tale character. I love playing her because she's not just beautiful, she's brave. But Snow White might have been locked away in the pages of a book forever without Walt Disney. He was the one who found her in his book of fairy tales and gave her new life on the big screen. But to do that, he had to create a whole new kind of movie. Something no one thought was possible. An animated feature film. It changed the history of movies forever. But here's the thing. It almost didn't happen. This story begins in 1923 with a young cartoonist named Walt Disney getting on a train for Hollywood with a little bit of money, but a lot of ambition. One of his fellow passengers asked him what his business was in California, and Walt said, I make cartoons. And the reaction was, oh. <laughs> like, oh, so you, uh, you clean out stables. And I think Walt had it in the back of his mind that someday he was going to make a cartoon that would be so spectacular that Hollywood would turn out for a big premiere. Eleven years after arriving in Hollywood, Walt and his brother Roy, with some help from a certain mouse named Mickey, had managed to create a successful animation studio. But Walt still dreamed of bigger things. In 1934, Walt gathers some of his top animators and he gives them 50 cents. He says, go buy dinner across the street and come back to the soundstage. When they come back, there's Walt in a darkened room with a spotlight on him and he begins to tell them this amazing story. The story of Snow White, as he imagines it. The story he told came from an old folk tale. A young girl escapes her jealous stepmother and hides in a cabin in the woods. But it's not long before danger arrives at her door. His entire team of artists, they're mesmerized. But he didn't just tell the story, he became the story. He was the characters. He did the sweet little girl, he, he did the, the, the huntsman, he did the, the scary witch, he did everything. Walt was a great actor. He actually acted out the entire story in front of them. And finally he says, boys, we are going to make this a feature-length animated cartoon. They were dumbfounded. I don't think that his animators at that point could understand what that meant. Up until this time, cartoons were eight to 10 minutes. You tell a funny little story, and that's pretty much it. There's always naysayers in Hollywood. People were saying, oh, you can't look at all that for an hour and a half. It's gonna hurt your eyes. Everybody's gonna be running out of the theater with their eyes bleeding. This was also during the Great Depression. And Walt's wife, Lillian, was afraid this was not a time to do risky financial projects. His brother, Roy, the financial head of the studio, was nervous about it, too. But typical Walt, give me a challenge and I will step up. Tell me I can't do something and I will step up. Walt grew up in a family that was not dirt poor, but they were always needing money. So to help support the family, his father made nine-year-old Walt run a paper route. He had to get up every day at 3 a.m. to deliver newspapers before school, rain or shine. Walt would have nightmares into his adulthood of trudging through the snow delivering papers. 
I mean, this is, this is a very tough childhood. But there were bright spots for Walt. Every night, his grandmother would pull down a book of fairy tales and read to him. Walt would lose himself in the stories. Often in times of crisis, we turn to fairy tales. We need them as a kind of comfort and consolation. Fairy tales didn't come out of nowhere. They were based on oral tales that are much older than the tales in the Bible. The Grimm brothers believed these wonderful tales would vanish, so they collected them and wrote them down. These are the stories that we hear as children, helping us find a pathway from childhood into adulthood. On the last weekend of January 1917, Walt went to a screening of the silent film version of Snow White. He was absolutely transfixed by the film. He loved the story. And that stays with him the way our teenage influences often do. The way we're influenced by art or music or film. Snow White is that piece of his youth that stays with him. And Walt held on to the memory of Snow White until he was ready to make his own feature film. That evening in 1934, when Walt told the story to his staff, it had a profound effect on everybody who was there. Walt had put everyone in that room under his spell. They left believing they could make the movie and make history. What neither they nor Walt Disney knew was just how hard it was going to be. When Walt Disney decided to turn an old folktale, Snow White, into a feature-length movie, he started by asking, how exactly would he tell this story? He knew that to entertain people for a feature-length cartoon, the storytelling had to be much more sophisticated, much deeper than what a short cartoon was. He goes out and he looks at any and every version of Snow White that he can find, and there are many. And what he finds is, all the different versions have certain things in common. Someone who's crazy jealous, an innocent heroine who has to run for her life, and a really handsome guy who saves her. But the details vary. If you go back to the earliest versions of Snow White, you discover it's not a cruel stepmother who wants to get her out of the way. It's the biological mother sending the girl out in the woods. My theory is that the Grimm's adored their mother, and so they transformed the mother into a stepmother. If you look at the Grimm's fairy tale, it tells you how serious the queen is, like she wants Snow White gone. It's so dark. In the Grimm's tale, the queen orders her huntsmen to kill Snow White and bring back her liver and lungs as proof she's dead. The queen then cooks, salts, and eats them, thinking they are Snow White's. What the queen doesn't know is that the huntsman has freed Snow White and the lungs and liver are from a wild boar. This was a bit too much for Walt Disney. In his telling, he simply has the huntsman return with Snow White's heart in a box. The heart of a pig, and I've been tricked. Walt was worried about another section of the Grimm's version, the part where the stepmother tries to get rid of beautiful Snow White forever. She comes to the dwarf's cottage disguised as a peddler woman selling corset laces. 
Snow White thinks she's a kind old woman and tries the laces on. But the witch pulls the laces so tight that Snow White collapses and nearly suffocates. The witch visits again, and this time Snow White lets her comb her hair. But the comb turns out to be poisonous. She comes again, this time selling beautiful apples. Walt knows that the three attempts to kill Snow White would feel repetitive in a movie. So he takes out death by comb and death by laces and sticks with death by apple. And in the end, what you wind up with is a very tight framework that would animate well. So in August of 1934, when Disney finally sits down with his animators, he begins with the dwarfs. In most earlier versions of the story, the dwarfs were just kind of an anonymous group. They had not really been differentiated. That's a huge challenge. We have seven characters who look practically alike. How do you define them for the audience? The way they figured it out was to name them and suddenly they become individualized. They spent quite a lot of time coming up with all of these different, very strange names. There were so many names to choose from that it took a while. But eventually they came up with seven that had traits they could easily animate. If it's bashful, well, he acts bashful. He ties his beard in a knot and goes, oh, gosh. <laughs> you know, he, if it's dopey, you know, he shakes his head and it takes about three years for the hat to catch up. A lot of the early development on the dwarves looked like illustrated children's books from Europe. But these characters weren't quite animatable yet. And so they created what you could call Disney style, where this kind of rounded shape, you know, where one shape hooks quite beautifully into the next, so that if Grumpy was proud, he could puff his chest out and he could fold his arms like so. The dwarfs were full of comic possibilities, but what about the heroine? Maybe I'm biased, but there's no story without Snow White. Snow White was a kind, simple little girl who believed in wishing and waiting for her Prince Charming to come along. Walt knew right from the beginning that the visual appearance of Snow White would be a big challenge. No character is fully formed right off the bat. Walt Disney's original idea is all American, girl next door, attractive, not threatening in any way version of femininity. They had to create a character that was both appealing and believable, but yet they also had to create a character that you could animate. Early Snow Whites were blonde, redhead. There are many different versions. After going to the drawing board time and time again to kind of really nail what that final design was going to be, then they came to the Snow White that we all know. Lips red as the rose, hair black as ebony, skin white as snow. Snow White was perfect, but Walt wanted everything in the film to be perfect. He was at the studio day and night. He started becoming more irritable, losing sleep. He had had a nervous breakdown in 1931. Roy worried that it was just a matter of time before Walt had another nervous breakdown. Something needed to be done. By the summer of 1935, the pressure of turning Snow White the fairy tale into Snow White the movie was getting to be too much. So 
Walt and Roy and their wives left the studio and went to Europe. And the idea was to get completely away from production. So there is this period that nothing was happening for Snow White. People are getting concerned. Is Disney able to do this? Is there any Snow White without Walt? Walt was the vision, Walt was the engine. And if this was not going to go through, that entire dream was just down the toilet. People around Hollywood were calling it Disney's folly. They had no conviction that he could actually pull it off. One day, while Walt and Roy were in Paris, they stumbled onto an amazing thing. A movie house had strung together a bunch of Mickey Mouse shorts into one long, full-length film. You could just see Walt poking his brother and saying, see, this is why we should be doing a feature. The trip was just what he needed. When the Disneys returned to Los Angeles, Walt was back on track. The first thing on his to-do list, cast the voice of Snow White. In terms of really bringing the character to life, you need the voice. It's critical. Walt had a speaker put in his office, so he could listen to the auditions, and he wouldn't be swayed by how the actress looked. All the actresses and voice people in California were brought in. Finally, this woman was brought in. She's 18 at the time. She very smartly knew that Disney was looking for someone younger than her age. And so she did a falsetto voice. That was Adriana Casalotti. Want to know a secret? Promise not to tell? We are standing by your wishing well. It's a very pure voice. It's... Oh. That, that high-pitched sort of bird-like mm -hmm. kind of voice, which I think is so beautiful. Now, when we started Snow White, of course, we wanted the songs to stand on their own merits. It's easy to forget that Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs is a musical. The songs fit right into the story. Disney wants a musical where a song is integrated into the narrative. You knew what the motivations of the characters were. Uh, Hi-ho, hi-ho, we dig, 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 and you know, all these things. It was a very, very wonderful lesson in how to tell story with songs. In every musical, we have that moment we call the I Want song, when the character says, this is what I want. Someday, my prince will come. Gorgeous. Just gorgeous. And, you know, each time you listen, it drew you back in. So now they've got characters, he's got the story, he's got the music, but Walt knew right from the beginning that animation would be the biggest challenge in making the film. Now we were dealing in, in motion, movement, and the flow of movement, the flow of things. How do you get an audience to actually believe a cartoon is alive? Walt experimented on a short cartoon called The Goddess of Spring which was supposed to be a testing ground to see if they could make a human character look real. And even with the most kindness that I can muster, it was not very good. She was kind of rubber hosey and, you know, almost like olive oil. Walt saw it and said, okay, we gotta get up our game here, folks. So for the dwarves, he brought in well-known vaudeville performers of the period in order to perform for the animators. If someone with baggy pants is dancing, the cuff of the pants is going to reach the floor after the foot does. And if you can capture that, you're suddenly giving life not just to the character, but to the entire world that the character is a part of. My name is Marge Champion, and I was a live action model for Snow White when I was 14 years old. They hired Marge to come in and wear a costume like Snow White and do all the things that Snow White did to get an idea of how her movements should actually look. They wanted the animators to see the subtleties that might be in the performance that then they could transfer to their animation. They needed me to look like I was uh, being caught 
by trees or bushes when I was running away from that terrible man. Live action reference became a very vital part of the animation process because the animators could be inspired as they were shaping their characters. It wasn't just how the drawings looked, it was the pacing, it was the timing. That is the true test of animation, and that is why animators are called actors with a pencil. A really famous example of that is the soup sequence, where Snow White tries to teach the dwarves how to be a little bit more well-mannered as they're eating. They did some of the funniest facial expression animation of all the dwarves eating soup in their individual dwarf ways. Grumpy would eat it like Grumpy. Bashful would eat it like Bashful. This delightful song called Music in Your Soup. It's a funny, funny song. It's wonderful. It uplifted people. You can make things hum with the sum, sum, sum of the music in your soup. When Walt Disney was looking at the art form, he was always looking at the potential of what it could be. As Disney's constantly striving to create this sense of life, he's challenged always and continually by two dimensions. The problem was how to take a painting and make it behave like a real piece of scenery under the camera. This was an engineering challenge that he posed to his camera department, and the end result was the multiplane camera crane. It was huge. It had several panes of glass on which would be painted foreground levels, background levels. And the camera literally shoots down through all of those six planes. And as they would move the camera, the levels closest to the camera would go out of focus, just the way that it would in a live action shoot. And it gave it a sense of depth. The multiplane camera was a huge step forward for Walt creatively. And even though it was time consuming and slowed the entire production down, for him it was worth it. Big news from Hollywood. Mickey Mouse becomes an RKO star. Walt, we're very proud to have you and your great stars associated with RKO Radio Pictures. But we're very proud to be with RKO. <laughs> right on the dotted line, Walt. The pleasure. In 1936, Walt and Roy committed themselves to distributing their films through RKO. Walt signs with RKO and says, I'm going to deliver this by Christmas of 37. Now he's really got to, to push it because he's committed. And so the pressure was on. Everything was planned to coordinate with this Christmas time opening. Problem was that they didn't have a movie yet. Walt Disney signed a deal with RKO Pictures to distribute his films. This meant his Snow White feature was going to premiere at Christmas in 1937. But in January of that year, with just 11 months to go, they were nowhere near finished. The clock was ticking. Walt needed to step in and take drastic measures or the film would never get completed on time. People are working on 12-hour shifts. You have crews coming in, cameras going day and night. You have 12 drawings for every second of time. When you have several characters in one scene, you have a drawing for each character. That's a huge amount of drawings involved. So he implements a bonus system. If you're a good drawer, you can draw quickly and you produce quality drawing, you are heavily rewarded. But it quickly became obvious that he required a larger body of artists. In a handful of months, staff grew to nearly a thousand people. But all those new employees meant one thing, more bills to pay. The financial burden is becoming more and more serious, and the bank has been very understanding. But that amount of money is starting to really pile up, and at that point, Walt had personally hawked everything. He was leveraging his life insurance, his car. He was in so deep that if they failed to complete it, 
That probably would have been the end of the line for Walt Disney. Even with so much at stake, Walt's perfectionism didn't let up. Not a single frame or a painted cell was approved for Snow White until he had personally checked it. My name is Wilma Baker. I was a painter on Snow White. Walt Disney, as a perfectionist, was looking over the shoulder of one of the painters, and he noticed that Snow White's face was very white. And he suggested to her, could you make her look more alive, more colorful? It was the gals in Ink and Paint that kind of saved the day on that, that little, you know, I'm sure mini crisis. They shaded it to make it look like a real rosy cheek. They did such an amazing job. Snow White's cheeks are so rosy and natural looking that people still wonder if the ladies in ink and paint used their own makeup. What they really did was they put a little drop of red dye there, which is absorbed into the cell, and it gives this sort of glow. This blend technique was applied to every cell that Snow White appeared in. Walt always wanted it right, and so we got it right. I'm so ashamed of the fuss I made. This was going to be the first feature-length animated cartoon, and he wanted it to be absolutely perfect in every way. They sweated over every detail on this film and making sure that everything was, was just right. Sometimes that meant cutting sequences that were already in work. The soup-eating sequence is the quintessential casualty of Snow White. When they put it in and looked at it, it just, the story just kind of came to a halt and Walt realized it wasn't right. And so out it went. We still do that now. We still entangled in Zootopia and in all these other films that we're making now, the big sequences still get lifted out and cut because part of our responsibility is to make sure the movie is moving and, and being told as efficiently as possible. And there's, there's brilliant work that goes onto the cutting room floor. Then came a shocker. My big brother Roy told me that we would have to borrow another quarter of a million dollars to finish the movie. The banker is starting to say, look, well, we want to help you out, but we need to take a look at this film that they were investing so much money in. Walt really, really didn't want to show any part of this film to anyone until it was finished. But Roy said, look, <laughs> our backs are against the wall here. So Walt reluctantly agreed to a Saturday screening for Joe Rosenberg, the banker. Walt grits his teeth, goes to the projection room, and presents this work in progress. Slave in the magic mirror. And what he's showing to the banker is, is a patchwork. Through wind and darkness, I summon... Parts of it are beautiful. Parts of it are still pencil sketches. Parts of it are story sketches, and he's talking to him all through it. Now, when we get this finished, this part is really going to be beautiful. What I imagine in this screening is Walt is trying to give the banker that magic, that inspiration that Walt had had when he saw Snow White for the first time. They get to the end of the film, and they go outside, and Rosenberg is talking about the weather. He's talking about everything under the sun except the movie that they've just seen. And Walt Disney is just standing there, waiting, knowing that all his work, the whole gamble, is riding on what Joe Rosenberg is going to say next. With only three months until the premiere of Snow White, Walt Disney had run out of money. Without a loan from the bank, there would be no film. The only thing was, the banker insisted on seeing the movie. The unfinished movie. After he watched, the banker just chatted away making small talk, while Walt waited to find out Snow White's fate. Eventually, 
Rosenberg got into his car, rolled down the window and said, well, so long, Walt. You're going to make a pot of money on that picture. So now they've got the money that they need. What they don't have is time. Not only that, but Walt left the hardest scenes for last. He started with the simpler ones first so that artists could sharpen their skills. The downside was he had these very, very difficult scenes to do when all of this pressure was ramping up. Walt knew that the hardest sequences for the animators were when Snow White and the Prince are together, and the scary scene when Snow White escapes the Huntsman. The branches gripping at her, the logs becoming alligators, and the eyes always present, peering in, the fear of the unknown out there threatening. This was going to be a big undertaking. There was one more scene, and the whole movie rested on it. It was the scene where the dwarfs are weeping over the body of Snow White. This is the most important scene Walt had ever done. Walt was very concerned that his audience would not be emotionally moved, that they would not feel love, they would not feel sadness. Can an animated form actually make you cry? If the audience laughed or thought it was ludicrous that these round little guys who've made you laugh throughout the entire film now start to cry and weep over another cartoon character who's supposedly dead, the film would not work. cells came through ink and paint and moved onto camera literally days before the film premieres. You got some really heroic efforts at the last minute by these artists who could do the seemingly impossible and then go back and work it over and make it even better. Some retake orders were dated four days before the premiere. It came down that close. Hollywood, accustomed to gale openings, turns out for the most spectacular of them all. The world premiere of the million and a half dollar fairy tale fantasy, Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. The night of the premiere was kind of a big deal. You have Shirley Temple walking down the red carpet with her friends. Marlene Dietrich was there. Just a whole who's who of Hollywood royalty was attending. I went to the opening at the Carthay Circle. I was enjoying every minute of it. Walt's wish from long ago came true. The biggest celebrities in Hollywood were turning out for a premiere, and it was one of his cartoons. Walt was very nervous. He had so much at stake, and he still had no idea if an audience would like it. If they failed at this point, a lot of people were going to see them fail. Walt takes his seat. The lights go down. The curtains begin to rise. This is the moment he has been waiting for. And now all he can do is watch and wait. From the moment the first image was projected on the screen, you could feel the audience being drawn into the world Walt had created. I'm wishing, I'm wishing. Run! Run away! Hide! In the woods, anywhere! They laughed at the gags. They oohed and awed over the visual effects. The beautiful watercolor backgrounds, the animation, the, the incredible music, everything came together to make this perfect film. 
the real test came toward the end. You've got a really emotional situation. You have these tall candles that are melting wax that mimic the tears that roll down the dwarf's faces. In that moment, the Disney artists were in the theater and they're hearing people sob. Great storytelling is a very magical thing. Now here's the prince and he's come back. Even thinking about it, you know, it, it's, it's very amazing. And then Prince takes Snow White off to her castle in the clouds. And the audience erupts in applause. And in that moment, they knew that they had just created something magnificent. This film was rapturously received. Reviewers couldn't find enough superlatives to describe it. It premiered in 49 countries, was dubbed in 10 languages. It was the number one movie of the year. People went, and not just to see the novelty of the first animated feature, it was because the story moved them. It was because the story made them laugh. The characters were so special. When the Academy Award nominations came out, there wasn't a category for best animated feature film. There were no other animated features. But Snow White was so exceptional that the Academy actually awarded Walt a special Oscar. The Oscar is, first of all, the coolest Oscar they've ever given out. Oh, it's beautiful. Aren't you proud of it, Mr. Disney? Well, I'm so proud, I think I'll bust. <laughs> I mean, look at it. It's, this, it's a big Oscar and then seven little Oscars on one stand to really say this is something special. This is groundbreaking. It was such a huge success, all of a sudden, this kind of a movie was viable. It actually prompted MGM to finally greenlight The Wizard of Oz. If there hadn't been a Snow White, back in the 1930s with Walt and his crew, there, there certainly wouldn't have been a tangle. I don't think there could be on an Elsa without Snow White. Snow White does tell us that there is a happily ever after, and that is what fairy tales do. They say, you can make it through this, you can survive. You will get out of the woods somehow. We need happily ever afters, and Walt gave us them. There is a level of artistry that's way above anything that had been done. And I think that's one of the reasons why Snow White and Seven Dwarfs will stand the test of time. It already has, and it will continue long after we're gone. Walt Disney had a vision, and he risked everything his reputation, his fortune, his future, even his health, to bring it to life. That's what artists do. So can you guys name the seven dwarfs? Oh, oh no. I, no, that's tough. Uh, sneezy, uh, who's the angry one? Bashful. Did we say sleepy? Did we say sleepy? <sighs> sleepy. Grumpy. Then there's the chubby one. Dopey. Uh, sleepy, dopey, sneezy, happy. Sneezy? Um, dirty? <laughs> you need to find that bomb now. If you think you know who the FBI traitor is, you're Three, dead. Two, wrong.